Hello everyone and welcome to another video from Carl's Tech Shed. Well what I've got here for you today is a really interesting piece of equipment I bought down at the car boot sale this morning. This is an NDB2 navigation data bank updater. It's made by the Vanding Corporation. I've never heard of them and I can't find any information about them on Google um, so I definitely won't be able to find any information about the machine. Now this looks like it was made, made in maybe the late 70s, early 80s, something like that. Um, it's obviously been made to a very high specification. You can tell just by the build quality overall. It's very heavy. It weighs about 20 pounds or about 12 kilograms. Um, it's, it's all steel and aluminium. All the front here is all aluminium. Um, the back and all the sides and underneath all of that is steel and it's very heavily built. So, um, judging by what this is called, because it's called a navigation data bank updater, I would guess that this is something to do with either the aerospace or maritime industry. Um, because this is uh, sort of late 70s, early 80s, uh, this would have been long before GPS or any of the modern navigation uh, tools would have been in use. So this probably would have had some sort of mapping software or something like that on it. I can't be 100% certain because, I, uh, again, I don't have any, any information about it. So um, we're going to have a, have a look inside and uh, see, what it, see what's inside it. We'll have a look at the front of this first. Here we've just got a memory display. Now this is just a standard uh, seven segment LCD display, but unfortunately this has been damaged at some point so we won't be able to see anything on that. Just below here we've got a series of rotary encoders on the memory address. Each of these go between zero and nine and then they flip over to A to F. So um, that's obviously for the individual memory. We've got here a small momentary switch which flips between load and verify. Uh, now down here we've got a couple of indicator lights. These are incandescent bulbs, these are not LEDs. Um, but this is a very unusual looking switch. Um, I have seen these before but this is a very, very nice switch. Let me show you how this works. So when it's in the off state you, you just have to push it up and it powers on. But if you want to turn it off you can't turn it off by accident if you knock the switch. You actually have to lift the switch and then pull it down to turn it off. So as you can see there's there's been a lot of thought put into this so obviously because of the sort of environment this is going to be used in um, and because of the sort of uh, application it's used in if you're copying information from one uh, cassette tape onto a memory device or something like that and you switch it off accidentally halfway through uh, that could corrupt the data permanently and you don't want that to happen. So adding something very simple like this this type of power switch um, is is a very clever idea and um, you know this this individual switch must have you know must have been a fair price when it was new but I suppose the sort of industry this was going into cost wasn't really an issue and especially with something like a, a switch like that um, it was it was absolutely essential. Now here we have a, a little slot which is marked update tape. Now it doesn't specify what sort of tape this takes. The only way I can describe it is it's about the width of a standard 8-track audio cassette. Although I'm not, I, I very much doubt that it would use an 8-track audio cassette. But I suppose anything's possible in this old sort of equipment which was sort of pulled together by a, by a small team of engineers. Now as you can see there's two small switches down there. Now I've tried to trigger these a few times but they don't seem to do anything. I'll show you what happens when I, when I power this on and press in those two little switches. Now as you can see I'm not sure if this tape drive is faulty but you'd expect maybe the, the uh, feed motor to start spinning or, or something to happen when you press those in. I've also tried holding these in while, uh, uh, while flicking this little switch but unfortunately nothing happens. Now if we have a look down here um, we've got a series of uh, three indicator lights. These are the same incandescent lights as the system fail and power. Uh, lights and then here we've got another momentary switch which is marked load start so we push that up and you see um, these these two LEDs sorry these two lights are blinking that's not an artifact on the camera um, now if I let that go you can see this one remains solid I hold that up again 
when they start flashing. So I reckon that's something to do with the power supply. I reckon maybe one of the capacitors is, uh, is not working properly or something like that, which is why it's causing them to flash. And finally on this side we've just got a memory module slot and down in the bottom there you've got a female DB37 connector um, and then above that I thought originally that was maybe a micro switch or something to indicate that the uh, memory module had been placed into the slot but uh, that's, that's nothing, that's just a screw which is on the other side. As you can see on the back here we've got a, a metal grill for, for ventilation and on the bottom we've got another metal grill. On the back here we've got a, a, a warning sticker, we've got the mains input cable, we've got the mains fuse and we've got this small metal plate here which says that this is an NDB2 navigation data bank update as it said on the front. We've also got a part number here which is 23301 and then in this metal bit here it's 1-01. Uh, so I'm guessing this is one of the, the earliest possible revision of this piece of equipment if it was revised at all after this was initially made. Now we've also got a serial number here which is 147 so as I, as I assumed uh, just judging by the build quality of this there's going to be a very small number of these manufactured because not only is it a very well built piece of equipment and it's handmade or at least it looks like it's handmade but this would obviously be going into a very niche industry where you wouldn't need many of these around and not only that but if, if any of these were faulty at any time these would not be thrown out and replaced they would be repaired and upgraded as necessary which is why you probably wouldn't need many of them about. Um, this also got the weight on here now I was pretty accurate when I said it weighs about 20 pounds weight here is 23.4 pounds um, voltage input 230 at 47 to 440 hertz so that's quite a quite a wide range on the frequency there so I wonder if they'd be using that in a in a maritime position if, if that would be maybe used on a boat or a ship or something like that where they had an unusual uh, power standard. Well now that I've taken the top cover off you can see all the cable looms in here um, all of these are connecting the instruments on the front panel over to the boards in the back here so all of the boards here are, are covered by this metal housing which I'm going to take off in just a moment so up here we've got all the um, memory and processing going on up here and then we've just got the power supply underneath here now what's interesting about this is that a lot of these um, of, of these cables have these connectors in the middle so obviously these were designed not only to be serviced but also to be uh, easily replaceable so for example if, if something were wrong with the front panel instead of uh, you know sending this off to be repaired or spending hours trying to trying to repair it you could just have have a spare one uh, laying about in your workshop or, or in your warehouse um, swap out the front panel, plug it in and you're back up and running in a matter of minutes rather than hours and then obviously you could uh, repair the, the defective front panel at a later date you know when when it's convenient. Well I've now taken the card cage off the top of the main PCB here as you can see this is the old tin type PCB I haven't seen these for years and usually when I do see them they're, they're in old uh, audio equipment and stuff like that it's very unusual to, to see them in old computer equipment like this the main processor on this is an Intel 8085. Um, I've tried to decipher the date code, but obviously if anyone knows about the 8085s, the date codes are difficult to decipher. You can't really decipher them to a week and a year. You can only decipher them to within a year or so. So this, is made, this one here was made between the middle of 1979 and the middle of 1980. Now if we have a look over here, all of these uh, small DIP packages, these are all just 7400 series logic chips uh, and over here we've got some uh, resistor arrays which are in these sort of custom packages. Uh, there's a few transistors, power transistors and bits and pieces like that. Um, and then down here we've got another IC, I've had a look at the part number on this but I can't find any information about it. The date code is uh, the 24th week of 1979 so obviously this is well before the internet was was around so any data sheets on on this probably aren't even on you know uh, haven't even been placed on online so that's why I can't find any information about it 
and the same goes with this little dip package here um, the date code on this again is uh, 50th week of 1979 so I'm not really sure what that is either but again a lot of these um, 7400 series all of the date codes are around 1978-1979 so I think it's fair to say that this was built uh, around the, the early 1980s something like that these are the two PCBs which were in the card cage and you'll notice that throughout this entire machine no two PCBs have been manufactured in the same way. As you can see on here we've got the old tin type PCB which I think is on FR1 material. Uh, we've got this blue PCB which I'm going to go into in more detail in a moment. This is uh, I think it's FR2 and this one is the more modern FR4. So as you can see none of these are identical in any way. They've all been developed in a, in a a different way most likely by different people or different teams and they've all been combined to to produce one piece of equipment with all these different types of technology in We'll have a look at this PCB first. As you can see, this is the only board out of all of them which has the company's name on. As you can see there, it says Vandling Corporation DIU Processor Assembly. And you'll see where it says REV, that's the revision number. So I'm assuming this is the first revision and any subsequent revisions would have a number after the word REV. Now, as you can see here, um, the main microprocessor on this board is a 6502, and then under here we've got a couple of MC6821CP uh, chips. Uh, these, I think, are interface controllers, so these would be to control the tape drive and the uh, memory module. You'll also see here that there's a small EEPROM, and the sticker on here says that this was updated on the 11th of May 1981. So obviously this has been built long before that, and this has then been added or upgraded to uh, upgrade the firmware on this. And again, same as the first board, we've got a lot of uh, 7400 series logic devices, a uh, few capacitors. You can see there's a lot of bodge wires on here. We've got six down here here we've then got a lot over here and if we flip it over on the back there's even more um, as you can see most of these lead up to this small uh, this this small IC here which again is another 7400 series IC so I'm guessing maybe that was an afterthought because as you can see there's no tracks leading from that so that's obviously had the PCB drilled out um, the IC has been inserted into the top and then the wires have just been run by hand down to the various pads on the PCB so it's definitely an afterthought it's uh, quite unusual to see that especially with without any tracks next to it now this board in my opinion is the most interesting out of all of these and it's not because of what's on top of it it's because of what's underneath it as you can see this is an old FR2 board and this is ha this has no um, no tin or copper on it whatsoever. Um, this is just a blank PCB and it's all been hand wired to all of the individual ICs on the other side. And you can see all of these little pin headers here. You can see all of these labels underneath. Obviously, the poor person who had to put this thing together had to know exactly where each cable went. And they've obviously just stuck a piece of masking tape on the top so that they can have an idea of which cable goes where. Now if we flip this over and have a look at some of these chips, you can see that all of these are socketed. Um, the majority of these, there's actually 16 of these CD4054BE chips made by RCA. These are seven segment display controllers. Now considering that the seven segment display on the front only has five characters, I'm not sure why they've got exactly 16 of these chips. Um, so it's a bit of a mystery really because each one supports one single seven segment display so effectively there's just five but when you look at these other components you've got a series of what look like the bodges um, there's just a, a series of these blank caps which go into the um, into the dip sockets and then you've just got either a, a transistor and a few diodes or like down here you've just got a transistor and a few resistors um, so it's quite unusual to see that uh, maybe this was uh, for future expansion maybe um, if they needed to put other integrated circuits into this they could but in the meantime they needed some way of uh, capping or you know sort of terminating this to complete the circuits so they just added some resistors and transistors to uh, to do that 
but it's very interesting because this whole board has no uh, automation in the manufacturing process whatsoever. Um, every single component on this, even the edge connectors, the wiring, the pins on the back, all of the dip sockets and even uh, all of these cables, every single piece of this is handmade and I've, I can't say I've ever seen anything like this. Um, before which is entirely handmade so you can see this is obviously a very low run of these machines were manufactured because if you're making thousands of these um, you'd want to bring the labor costs down uh, to a minimum and by doing that you'd create an entire PCB just like with these ones over here you'd want to create a PCB which was easy cheap and quick to assemble but with something like this uh, if you're only churning out uh, you know a few dozen of these less than a hundred or a few hundred you know if you have to pay some guy a couple of hours labor to or, you know to hand solder these then I suppose it's not the end of the world especially if you're charging a few thousand pounds for this piece of equipment well this is the inside of the front panel as you can see up here this is where the LCD display is and we've got this old I think this is an old FR1 type board but there's no connectors on this um, I'm going to take this out I'll let you have a closer look at this in just a minute down here this is the rotary encoder for the uh, memory setting here we've just got the switch which is next to it um, there's a lot of cabling again all of this is handmade and hand soldered down here we've got all of the indicator lights that unusual power switch and over here we've got the uh, the memory module uh, compartment now when I had a look at the front of this I saw this little piece of metal poking through the back and I thought maybe this was a screw but it actually looks more interesting than that. This, is, this looks like um, a catch because if you look closely you can see where this is worn so it looks like when the memory module was inserted it's got like a catch which would uh, latch onto this to prevent it from falling out so maybe you'd have maybe a lever or, or a little switch on the front which you would have to mechanically move to uh, to disengage it from this small spring so again it's it's all about making sure that the data isn't corrupted when it's being moved from the cassette tape to the memory device or vice versa and uh, lastly we've got the tape drive up here which again I'm going to take that out and we'll have a look at that closer in just a moment this is just like a like a dip package um, display so this is removable and replaceable so I'm guessing that um, had this actually been in operation and, and this needed to be replaced that they could have just taken this apart taken the display out insert a new one and it would have carried on working as you can see this is a very simple tape drive You've just got the single motor in the middle which has a very nasty crusty rubber wheel on it you've got two of these small micro switches here now I'm not really sure what these are for. This could be for to, to detect right protection on a tape or if the tape is double sided and you could turn it over to access the other tracks it could be to detect which side the tape is on. And over here we've got the, the combined write, erase and read head just here. Now because this tape drive just uses a standard DC motor instead of a stepper motor it's got this small optical encoder on the top which means that the computer can detect exactly where the tape is judging by the number of passes that the optical encoder has gone through. And finally on the back here we've just got the small rotary switch which is connected to the front. Um, this is connected in through this uh, large D sub connector as well and as you see it's actually held together with a small piece of string. I'm just going to take this metal panel off now and we'll see if we can have a look at the power supply. And finally these are the two power supplies which are in the bottom of this. I was quite surprised to see two power supplies because I mean this is just a, a very low low power appliance. Um, there's not really much power going into it. I can't see it consuming any more than maybe 50 or 60 watts so I'm not quite sure why they've got two power supplies but we'll have a look at them closer. As you can see we've just got this large uh, old fashioned step down transformer, um, we've got this very large Nippon Chemicon capacitor here which is uh, 6800 microfarads at 35 volts and uh, then just some very basic power components so it's a very basic power supply certainly uh, a lot more basic than, than what you'd find today and I must admit this is the first time I've, I've opened up uh, a piece of equipment like this and found a big old chunky transformer inside it 
usually the transformer would be uh, much smaller. Um, but if we have a look over here at this one, both of these power supplies are identical. So I'm not quite sure why why they've done this. Perhaps it's for redundancy. So if one power supply were to fail, then the other one would just take over automatically. But then again, you've got no way of indicating that the power supply has failed. So I'm not quite sure why they've done that. But just down here, there's just a small uh, a small filter which is bolted on the side here. Now I've noticed here on this on this small cable which is coming away from the power supply that there's like there's there's some sort of component under here. So I'm going to take this off and we'll have a look at that as well. Well, I've tried to remove this uh, this rubber housing around this but it's impossible to get it off without without cutting it in half and I don't really want to do that. Um, there's nothing really interesting in there as such, it's just a few resistors, a few diodes and a couple of capacitors. Well now that I've put this back together and I've had a look inside uh, I'm getting some ideas as to what this may have been used for. Now obviously this this update tape would have been used to copy data from a cassette tape onto some sort of uh, solid state storage. So the solid state storage would most likely have been uh, static RAM backed up with a battery or, or something like that because at the time flash memory would have been extremely expensive, very low speed and extremely low capacity. So it, it, it it's most likely going to be used in some sort of RAM disk or, or something similar to that. Now, as to what this went into, um, I'm not really sure. It was, it, judging by the build quality and the overall appeal of this product, it, it seems to be either marine or aviation. So it's either going into a boat or, or an aeroplane or something like that. But I could be wrong. Um, if anyone knows anything about this, um, please contact me and give me some information about this. In the meantime, I'm not really sure what to do with this. Uh, it'd be a shame to scrap it because it's such a nice piece of equipment and it's obviously been very well designed and I'm hoping that somebody could make use of it. So if you think you can make use of this, please send me a message and uh, I'll do my best to get it over to you. Well, thanks for watching my video and I'll have another one up very soon.